Thank you everybody for joining us once again for our segment on art. I am Chase Doherty, the Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Delaware Contemporary, and we are here today with guest curator Alexander Rosenberg and one of our key anchor artists for Through a Glass Darkly, Helen Lee. So thank you both for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Chase. Well, so I don't know, Helen, I thought maybe we could start just by um, talking about um, when we first started to talk to you about work in the show um, and kind of the theme that we were working with, like, you know, how, how the work that you were working on initially um, fit into that or, or, or you know, wh why was this show? Um, I think it was a good fit for you, but in your mind, you know, with your studio practice, like how did that kind of fit into what you were doing? Yeah. Um, well, if I recall correctly, um, I, I sort of replied to you all and dumped like, you know, decades worth of potential projects in your lap, <laughs> um, out of which the four that are in the show are sort of the four that like moved into fruition. Um, I guess one of them already existed, but um, got reconfigured. Um, and the other three are, are new pieces, just kind of exciting. Um, but I think through all of the works, I'm I'm definitely kind of using glass in this way that's asking us to sort of either mm, think through transparency or think through also um, sort of like in, inherited trauma or loss or narratives of um, of bias and certain gazes that uh, one encounters sort of through an immigrant lens. Um, and also I'm in a couple of the pieces um, like I would say the obverse reverse um, <clears throat> and the implicit and incendiary are sort of in that category. Um, but in, then brood and amulet are more so looking at my work that um, brood for sure um, is like this big old mashup of historical and personal narratives. Um, <clears throat> and then amulet, I think, he's into the part of my work where I'm just geeking out on language. Um, and actually someone, like I gave my artist talk in 2019 back at MIT um, and it was really sweet cause it was like home turf and all these people came out of the woodwork. Um, <clears throat> but an old friend of mine was like, oh yeah, it's like half of your work is like these deeply personal family narratives and the other half is just like this total complete geek out about type. And I'd never had somebody split my practice like that for me before and I was like, correct <laughs> <laughs> but I think what was sort of stunning about it was that that split also maps itself out into like perhaps like a Chinese identity and an American identity which is somewhat like uh like revelatory for myself because it's so often the case that I you know I think of my Chinese identity as something that's sort of like past or gone or silent or dormant <clears throat> um but to have someone else sort of point out the ways in which it evidences itself in my practice, which is sort of situated in a very like American component of my public persona, et cetera, was sort of like, oh, no one had ever phrased it to me about it. And that's a really good way of thinking about it. Um, and so I think these works sort of, you know, face opposite directions in that regard. That's so uh, interesting to hear. I know, and now we're kind of doing this a little bit backwards than what I was thinking about, but like, uh, it's okay. I, I was, looking at your work and kind of some other talks out of time. And I was thinking specifically about this story uh, or this kind of anecdote where you're speaking uh, Chinese to only one person in the entire world. And this idea of kind of language as this, as this kind of connection to family um, or something that's related to like kind of parenthood. Uh, so I was kind of seeing in some ways these, them kind of being really deeply connected in that way. And I wondered if you could talk about that in relation to some of this work, this idea of, um, yeah, I think kind of like language as it relates to parenthood. Yeah, I mean, I think Amulet definitely is in that space. <clears throat> and I wasn't really expecting this to, this sort of focal point to creep up on me. Um, but I, when I was, when I was young, I, I learned a phonetic system which I have since learned was basically like designed as a phonetic alphabet uh, to instruct Chinese. Um, it was designed by kind of a panel of linguists um, right around um, when imperial rule sort of ceased and um, 
you know, right around like 1912 into the 1920s um, in China. And, um, you know, as a kid, you just learn shit and you're like, oh, okay, that's what I learned. Like, you know, you don't sort of, nobody really contextualizes anything for of, of this for you. Um, so it was only like this year that I dug a little bit deeper into the history of this particular system of orienting oneself to all the sounds one can make in, in the Chinese language. Um, and it's, it's also the case that, you know, now, obviously, like in China, there's um, pinging is like the <clears throat> predominant uh, phonetic system and, you know, has global reach and is the, the mainstream way in which people access that language, um, particularly if you're in a language that's sort of Roman centric. Um, but this system that I learned is still taught in Taiwan and in a it's still utilized in a couple of overseas Asian communities. Um, and for the trajectory of people that sort of move from China to Taiwan, then to the US, it's still prevalent uh, within those education systems. So I'm teaching it to my daughter. She goes to a, you know, the weekend Chinese school here. Um, and we've been like really immersed in the system again, which I just wasn't expecting. I don't know. Like I just, I, I just didn't see this one coming. Like it's so obvious, but I, I didn't see this coming. I didn't see this becoming like a deep part of how I engage in language in my formative years. I didn't see it like coming back around to me in this way. Um, and I, I think you're right in pointing out that, like, for me, I had this singular relationship to this language. So weird when you, like, only speak a language with one person, you know, um, and when that person's relationship to that language is somewhat, like, um, you know, it moves through a couple of adjacency, adjacencies, like, it was their second dialect. Um, there were a lot of words that they didn't necessarily know the proper terminology, and so they just made up, you know, they made things up, <laughs> which is, like, so, such a part of like how languages evolve and such um but yeah my my life in my identity as a parent has been really steeped in this phonetic system lately um and so it's granted me an opportunity to like look back on it and learn more about it and understand its history and its context um and just like think through it a little bit mm -hmm. um so it's it's been fun and and I guess like um, you know, the, the, the brood work of all the cicadas on the wall references this history of a uh, funereal amulet in the shape of a cicada that was used as a symbol of, of rebirth and reincarnation. Um, and I guess I'm, <clears throat> um, those pieces sort of speak to each other, even just in physical proximity, their adjacencies. Um, but I'm thinking just sort of about like language itself and the transference of language as a form of reincarnation or like something that gets us close to that space of like mm -hmm. um of of actually like physically with our bodies reenacting these sounds that kind of like belonged to the generations of humanity before us hmm. yeah. i i have kind of even more questions about that but i'm thinking it might Go be a good it. well i'm thinking it might be a good moment to maybe just kind of describe um at least those two works or maybe you could kind of walk us through yeah. Uh, the works that are included in this, in yeah. this exhibit. <clears throat> so I'll start with Brood. Um, that one is this wall with, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. It, it's supposed to be 10 generations of cicadas where I'm defining a generation by powers of two. So on this wall are lots of cicadas. It starts with one, that's the darkest cicada, then it goes to two and then four, eight, etc. Um, and so it's kind of referential to just like the biological phenomena of powers of two in thinking through um, how reproduction works. Um, and I think uh, my, I guess there's multiple starting points here. There's like four different narratives that I'm weaving together here. One of them was just this fascination with the quantity of 10 generations of, of, one's, ex of one's lineage. Um, and that comes from this, um, this Buddhist folklore about the golden cicada, <clears throat> who was um, a disciple who like, you know, did something wrong and, and their punishment was to uh, endure and live 10 generations as a mortal. Um, and so it's it's really like that part of the story that I, I latch onto, um, <clears throat> that just imagining like what, 
what that quantity was, like what is 10 generations as immortal? And thinking through that, like from a very universal perspective of just imagining like 10 generations of anybody's ancestors, like the sheer math mathematics of that is like, oh my God, it's a, it's a lot of human, it's a huge sloth of history and humanity. And perhaps what's most like astonishing about that is, is how little we have access to, right? Like most people I feel like um feel pretty pretty good about like knowing their grandparents and like if you're lucky you know your great grandparents right and I don't I don't actually even know anybody that had knew their great great grandparents um and <clears throat> when you look at that wall so the secret I'm letting you in on is that what is on the wall is actually only nine generations of cicadas <laughs> <laughs> you know what we have to take we have to take it down now it's, it's sorry <laughs> it's inauthentic it's, it's like part of the brutality of that math is like for me to get the 10th generation is to double everything that's there and it's just like oh <laughs> so hopefully the next time it's installed there'll be 10 full generations but it's still like a staggering amount right um so that that's one narrative the other narrative i mentioned before this um narrative of the historic use of um funereal amulets in the shape of a cicada, they're often made out of jade um, <clears throat> as a symbol of rebirth. And they were used, um, they're placed on the tongue sort of in an effort to like seal um, the soul and the body along with like uh, bodily plugs for all the other orifices. Um, and then another historical narrative that I'm folding into the mix here is that jade historically, or sorry, glass historically was used in Chinese culture to imitate jade. Um, and there's like lots of art historical dialogue around like how you can tell if it's jade or if it's glass. Um, but that to me, I feel like is, um, I really love uh, evoking that history because um, it's sort of like, I don't know, it's just sort of great overlaid onto immigrant identity and trying to like relate to these uh, cultural stories from my particular ethnicity, um, but also like <clears throat> being totally American and like, wh what is what does it mean to like, uh, reenact a historical imitation, you know, um, and, and an effort to try to like gain access to these narratives that are from this particular culture. Um, what degree, like what is authentic and what is imitation um, is sort of like a really fun, I think, material overlay with just sort of my emotional experience of thinking through these narratives. Um, and then the last one is that my, my partner named our daughter Cicada. Um, and so I'm definitely like roping in my my life as a parent <clears throat> into this mix. Um, and and I guess also like thinking through, you know, she's mixed race. Um, her access to Chinese culture is mostly conduited through my own experience right now. Um, and and I'll often sort of speak to um like every single day as an immigrant American, just feeling like one one little small act of mourning after another in terms of just loss and trying to relate to um, a culture that like is not present, it's definitely not present in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> yeah, so that's that piece. Those are the, the four narratives that were kind of woven together in that work. Um, and then the other work um, more so directly addresses like uh, my inability to access the language uh, and my limitations in accessing the language uh, and also how that, well, that trajectory, I mean, is likely going to continue um, as the generations move on. Um, and so it's it's a video work um, that starts with my daughter reciting this quote unquote alphabet, phonetic alphabet. Um, and it transitions to myself reciting it um, and then I kind of, it closes out, um, and at the end, um, I reveal, uh, uh, it's cast glass, but it's gilded, so it's a golden cicada, um, that emerges on my tongue, um, and in that same time, um, there's sort of, like, audio of, like, a, you know, sort of that thrush of cicada sounds that you hear in the summertime, um, and in the gallery space, the, the audio, um, it's wireless headphones, so my hope is that viewers are like taking in that audio as they're also walking around and looking at the cicadas on the wall. Um, yeah, the, the two definitely play <laughs> off each other. Um, you know, it's just looking, watching at that piece and kind of thinking about it a little bit, I'm just kind of reminded of a poet friend of mine who used to like to kind of riff on this idea that like, 
language was something that starts as a sound. And I, I don't know if it's like necessarily that, but I would definitely say that like language is something that starts with a body. I wanted mm -hmm. to kind of talk about that a little bit, or, you know, if you agree, disagree, or kind of talk about the relationship to kind of body and language in your work. Yeah, no, certainly. There's someone that I used to quote on this. I think it was Roy Blount Jr. Um, <clears throat> I think the quote is that all, all language is body language. Um, I think it's something that's like easy to forget, right? Because especially like there, you know, especially like through the lens of technology and how mediated language becomes, um, but like, yes, there's a, there's a script and there's a syntax, but in the beginning there was speech, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that that is sort of the origin of all language. Um, like recently re my artist statement and one of the things that um, came out of that was that like, partly why I think I'm interested in, I mean, I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated in language you know, probably if I redid my undergraduate education, maybe I would have had the discipline to like study linguistics or something. In the meantime, I'm just an artist that makes work about language. Um, but I also think like partly what's so lovely about it is like just reaffirming this, um, this truth by which like every word and every language begins with breath. You know, and there's this like, there's this way in which it's like unique to humanity um, in in totally a baffling way. Like I, I remember I was doing like an artist talk Q&A um, and somebody was like, why, you know, they started just asking like the why question mark question. <laughs> it's like, this is especially in response to, um, I made a piece that had like 10,000 pieces of glass typography in it. Um, and first I was like, mm -hmm. Is, is aren't my intentions self-evident in the work? <laughs> you know? um, but also I think there's just a lot that's taken for granted, you know, in terms of how this functions. Like here I am over here, I like engage in this activity and I gift you, like I gift you and communicate to you like what is happening over here. Um, <clears throat> there's something just like phenomenal and unbelievable about that. Um, but also it just starts to get like so complex once we layer so many realities onto that in terms of like time passing, languages moving across different cultures, um, the way in which it gets mediated through so many different eras of, of, of technology and humanity. Um, all those things like really interest me and in, in how it's this constantly shape shifting uh, moving target. Mm. And I, this is maybe kind of a, a, a tangent, but as somebody who once carried drawers and drawers of lead type for you, I can attest to the, I can attest to the fact that even in that physical form, it is very like related to the physical body, <laughs> has yeah. mass, takes up space, um, takes yeah. energy to move. Um, I think uh, let's talk about the other piece. Uh, I'm I'm really I was looking back at some of the stories about that. Um, pitch drop experiment which was so like almost like tragic you know the poor person kind of like I, I don't know I'll let you I'll let you tell it I'll let you tell um it. yeah so implosive and incendiary I feel like this one's the hardest mm -hmm. for me to talk about uh, like I haven't fully processed why I brought that into the world yet um but the, it came from two different like physical making um, trajectories. One was um, the drops were referential to two different data points in, in drop type formations, one being the, the tar pitch drop. So this is this is famed in, in the land in the landscape of viscosity um, and weird material <laughs> studies. Um, but I, I think it was, I'm not even sure what sort of a scientist decided to do this, but they put tar pitch in a funnel um, and left it, you know, in a corner for 13 years. <laughs> to slowly make its way down the funnel and form the shape of a drop as it as it flowed very viscously um, through that form. Um, and I love that notion that like one single drop of this highly viscous material could, could form, but could take 13 years to form. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, I was thinking about, um, you know, the glass blower's delight of the Prince Rupert's drop, um, which is this like <clears throat> little curiosity in glass where you, you drop hot glass into cold water, it effectively becomes tempered. It's very, very strong, except the tail is thin enough to um, fracture easily. And when you fracture it, um, it fractures as tempered glass does. <clears throat> um, and that fracture, like it, it's actually um, known to have 
it travels down the entire body of the Prince Rupert's drop at a speed of Mach 5 is what it's been measured to travel at. So it's like almost instantaneous. Um, it's really quite remarkable to watch. But I was thinking about those two different data points of like, these are both um, drop type formations um, that, you know, and they, they have some similarities. Um, the tar, tar pitch, like it, it's on one hand, like glossy and smooth, but on the other hand, also quite coarse. Like there's some degree of like coarseness to it. Um, and then the Prince Rupert's drop, um, in my mind, because I once did strobe photography with them, um, and in that strobe photography, I was able to capture it, like, the shape of the drop, like, when it broke, as the fracture was traveling midway through the drop, and then my favorite was, like, um, the entire thing, the fracture had traveled all the way through the drop, and the entire thing had broken, but none of the there not enough time had passed for any of the particles to move outward yet, um, and and so I associate um, that particular capture of the Prince Rupert's drop as also like you know having many different particles and being somewhat like having this coarse texture, um, and I guess when I was making those Prince Rupert drops, um, well I did the stroke photography and at that time I was also I was dipping them in ink and exploding them in a tube to make these drawings. Um, and what I was thinking through at that time was sort of like this phenomenon that I'm sure many people have experienced where like, you know, just this very simple paradox where like a long period of time often feels really short and short periods of time can feel really long, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and in this piece, I guess I'm invoking that with respect to, um, I was thinking about how like so much of the American gaze on Asian identity is informed by these legacies of, you know, diaspora trajectories from hundreds of years ago that have nothing to do with my family's trajectory here. Um, and it sort of like doesn't really matter, like if you, when when your family moves here and you you exist in this space with an Asian body, like it doesn't matter. You you inherit those those histories, you inherit um, the outcomes of, of those biases and that gaze. Um, so I'm thinking one part about that, um, and the the pom-pom balls came from, um, um, I did a residency at Wasay Project in 2019, and you know I had my kid with me, we were in the family residency thing, um, it, it was more sort of like just committing time to being in my creative practice, but also having my kid. But I, I wasn't sort of super stoked to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna take over this big barn space and make a bunch of work in this compressed like week. Um, so instead I opted for one of the really small like 100 square foot um, spaces that was in the, um, the other building. Um, it's sort of like a, a cleaner space, a smaller space. Mostly I just wanted like a small space to think. Um, and then in terms of making, like I went there, it was really liberating because I went there with like no, no preconceived notions or plan for what I wanted to get done in that time. Um, so I just, I went to the hardware store and I spent a hundred dollars. I just like random ass shit. Um, it was so much fun. And I just like, I, we had certain, uh, I was sharing this opportunity with another family. So we had like structured hours for when I would be in the studio. Um, and I would just like give myself permission to just like make stuff in that time. Um, and one of the things that I made, uh, maybe I'll sh I can share an image of this, uh, maybe. Yeah, um, one of the things that I made in that time, um, I was just playing with matches a lot. So I kind of dug up this, um, this is just on my Instagram feed, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I was just doing these fun little compositions on the wall. Yeah, it's like, you know, blue tape, rubber bands, string, and matches. Um, but this, this is like a bunch of matches just like jammed into a ball of wood putty. <laughs> um, what else did I do? Oh, I had pool noodles in them. I really got to get back to this pool noodle piece. I really love that. <laughs> um, but the pom-pom ball was like, um, I don't know, something, I think that's sort of like the one thing that really stuck from that um, residency. And I, I just always wanted to get back to it. Um, and so I returned to it last year and, you know, went about it in a very Helen fashion. Um, I had my studio assistant like 3D print a little like center hub that would like, you know, make it so we could distribute the matches all the way around in like a axiosymmetrical way. 
Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so we we made sort of the match pom pom and then um, encased it in in a glass sphere. Um, and I guess I'm thinking, you know, especially with respect to inheriting certain histories that exist in this country, independent of what your own personal family's history is. Um, I'm just thinking about sort of like all of the potential energy and everything that's implicit and what's inherited there, um, particularly through the lens of like mental health per se. Um, I think that's like a really interesting like uh, facet of, of this particular cultural identity. Mm. I want to ask you one more thing about that piece or like there's something in particular that's kind of um, that, that I think about when I think about that pitch uh, experiment is this kind of like apocrypha that, um, you know, glass left alone for a long time is like still molten, you know, that like if you measure a window for hundreds of years that um, and, and of course that's totally wrong, but like the idea that something could be like really, really slowly in flux like that is exciting to me. Um, is that, does that kind of like figure at all into that, that kind of material, um, I guess that kind of comparison? No. <laughs> no, I, no, but it, it's kind of funny. I, I wasn't thinking about that. Um, I was more so thinking about these, the sort of like dueling characteristics of those two drop forms that I'd mentioned. Mm. But I do think there's something similar happening in the in the other piece, the obverse reverse work that operates in the same way that you're asking like, oh, is this one particular phenomena like materially referential or, or important in the work? Um, but I think like in, in the obverse reverse works, so I'm gonna pivot and talk about that piece. Um, I was thinking a lot about transparency in that piece is highly relevant to the dialogue I was trying to engage in. Um, I think, um, there's like a lot of contemporary discourse, you know, I think with Kathy Park Hong publishing Minor Feelings. Um, and, and in that book, um, I think one of her quotable quotes is, uh, she states something like, when, when, I hear, when I hear the expression that Asians are the next in line to be white, I replace the word white with invisible, Asians are the next in line to become invisible. Um, and so, you know, and there's that and many other, I could point to others as well in which like this notion of invisibility or like silence or just sort of like not being heard or seen has been attached to Asian American identity um, in this very like, you know, and I share my frustrations with that sentiment, um, but it's also the case that that, um, the interpretation of silence in that dynamic like is really simplified, right? <laughs> it's like really simplified and kind of like dumbed down this way that I'm like, um, the actual experience of silent silence in, in my experience of this identity is much, 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 much more complex than that. Um, and I was thinking about how if I equate silence with transparency, right, like our invisibility, um, it's kind of funny because from the glass perspective, that like that's the superpower like the fact that you can see <laughs> through it you know <laughs> um, and I wanted to just invert that power structure a little bit to to cite that like um you know obviously it's a problem when um silence is assigned upon a certain identity but when silence is practiced or chosen for xyz reasons um I wanted to also sort of like make space for um um, validating and empowering that, um, and also adding a lot more nuance and complexity to to the reasons one might wait what to the reasons why one might choose to do so. Um, and you know, I'm coming to this sort of from the angle of like like parenthood. I think is is an exceptional example of like when people choose to filter, what people choose to pass on, particularly in in light of like um, how one might or might not attempt to intercept patterns of intergenerational trauma. You know, like it, it actually is a requirement, right? <laughs> to like sort of edit certain things out um, if one chooses to attempt to like to heal some of those cycles of of harm um, that have been in place. Um, and so in that way, like I feel like evoking the transparency of the glass in that work is definitely like um, a really important part of the work for me. I, I love that, um, you know, transparency as a superpower. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think this might be a good place to uh, to kind of wrap, uh, but 
thanks so much for talking about your work and for doing the show. No problem. Yes, thank you to your both. Um, thank you to you both. And um, there's still time left to see Through a Glass Darkly. So for those of you who haven't seen it, please come down to the museum and check it out. It's just a wonderful show. And thank you both for coming. Thanks, Chase.